first video, we took a look at our market structure. We applied those assumptions to perfect competition, worked through all the algebra for average revenue, marginal revenue, figured out that all these guys are equal to price. Second video, we pulled all this forward to our costs. We took a look at, okay, for a representative, perfectly competitive firm, okay, we have our cost structure. We overlay the price onto it, and we worked out positive, zero, and negative profit. Our third video, what we're going to be taking a look at here, we're going to be bringing this forward as to what profit signals to us as we transition into the long run. And we're going to take a look at our stable, what we'd be calling kind of our uh, stable long run profit level for a perfectly competitive firm. So a big thing here, we're going to be kind of making the relationship as we jump from one short run period through the long run to another short run period. So again, if you go back to our video on the long run, keep in mind the way we define that long run was just a series of short runs. And that's what we're going to be doing here, jumping from one short run to another and seeing how that works out. Let's uh, bring all that all together. Okay, so so far we've taken a look at three different scenarios. We've taken a look at firms earning positive economic profit. And keep in mind with our curves, this was actually in the short run. Taking a look at firms earning zero profit in the short run. And we've taken a look at firms earning negative profit in the short run. What we want to take a look at here is what happens as these firms transition from one short run period to the next. That is, okay, we see we're moving through the long run, but right, the big way to think about it is we're going from one short run period to the next short run period. Um, what we're going to be taking a look at is what kind of signal this profit plays in it. And so the first big one to take a look at is this negative profit because, well, it kind of makes the most sense. So keep in mind, negative profit, what did we have? Uh, let's just draw a little line there and we can go, okay, we had negative profit. That was a case where our price was less than our average total cost, right? So the price was too low. This caused us to have a negative profit. Keep in mind this negative profit, this could be negative profit while operating or negative profit with shutdown. That distinction does not come into play for this. It's just strictly negative profit. Well, okay, you're losing money. In the short run, you can't do anything about it. In the short run, your decision is either you keep operating at a loss or you shut your doors. But if you shut your doors, you still have to pay for your capital cost, right? Because our big kind of determinant of our short run is that capital is fixed. Right, fixed level of capital. So you can't actually get out in the short run. You just have to either shut your doors and deal with that extra cost, fixed cost, or operate at a loss. The alternative though is once we transition into our long run, or more really from one short run period to the next short run period, those firms which are earning an economic loss, those firms that are not able to break even, well, negative economic profit they can begin to exit, right? They can begin to liquidate their capital. They can begin to exit the industry. And as they exit the industry, we're going to have less firms selling their goods, right? So we're going to have less firms selling their goods to this market. Well, what does that mean is we have less people selling their goods. We have less kind of well, this is less competition between all the different producers. They're not kind of trying to get, right? We have less stuff altogether. The market's not nearly as saturated. We're going to do a bit of our hand waving. This will make a bit more sense later on. But all of this, less firms, less goods, all of this, it actually will allow our price to start to rise, right? Less firms selling less goods means that the market's less saturated. If you're just thinking about it from this kind of scarce resource kind of thing, if everyone's trying to get gala apples, but there's less gala apples available for you to get, well, then the price of gala apples is going to start to climb. This price is going to continue to climb, right? So, okay, we went through this. Price less than average total cost. Firms begin to exit. Less firms means we have more scarce resource, more scarce goods, have a higher price because we get to fight over them. So as the price begins to rise, well, 
as our price begins to rise, this will continue until we arrive at a point such that our price equals the average total cost. And hey, if our price is equal to the average total cost, our profit will be equal to. That is, as long as we have negative profit, we will continue to have exit. As long as we have exit, prices will continue to rise. Prices are rising. We'll continue until we get to this point here. This here, this will be stable. Once we get to this situation, once the price gets to price equals average total cost, we don't have any incentive to leave anymore. So we have no incentive, no changing in the number of firms, no changing in the number of firms, no changing in price. No changing in price. We're stable. We're right there. We're at zero profit. So what ends up happening with negative profit? What about the other side of this? What about when we have a situation with our positive profit? So that's a case where price is above average total cost. And again, this is all negative profit in the short run, positive profit in the short run. Well, okay, we have positive profit. One of our big determinants of market structure was that we had no barriers. That is, okay, you are an entrepreneur, you're out of school, and you're trying to find hey, where do I want to start my business? I want to start a business. I want to make some money. Where is the best place to put my effort, my resources, my capital in order to get the best return? Oh, this industry is having positive economic profit. That is all the opportunity costs and everything. Getting a good return on all investment in the return on labor, return on capital. Everything is paying well here in this industry. So given that there's nothing to prevent you from entering this industry, this seems like the industry you should start your business in. So all of that to say, positive profit with no barriers is going to entice entry. Right? This is going to be all these new entrepreneurs, all these new business owners. You're going, that's where I need to get into. That's the business I need to start. Look at the money they're making. Well, okay, as we have entry, we now have more firms selling goods. More firms selling goods. So in this case here, more firms selling more goods. Our market is being starting to be saturated with the goods. So again, if we're still talking about our gala apples, our market's beginning to become saturated with gala apples. There's lots and lots and lots of apples there. Everywhere you look, there's more gala apples. So all these firms coming in selling more goods. This has the effect of causing our price to fall. As our price begins to fall, all right, right now price is above average total cost. It's now falling and will continue to fall until price equals average total cost and profit is zero. Again, this is going to be stable. Right? As long as we had positive profit, it attracted entry. This entry pushed down the prices. As prices fell, eventually they reached the average total cost. As soon as we hit zero profit, well, there's no incentive to enter anymore. Right? At zero profit, there's no incentive to leave, no incentive to enter. We're at a stable solution. So what we find is that if we have any profit, either negative or positive, this will entice either exit or entry, it will influence the price up or down until we arrive at this stable solution. So in that, what we can say, what we can finish off is that for a perfectly, for a perfectly competitive market, our long run economic profit will always equal we're able to earn short run profit. Yes, we can in the short run have positive profit, but all that's going to do is attract new firms, which will push down our price, which will bring something can happen. We can lose money, right? And we're going to have exit. Some firms aren't going to be able to cut it. They're not going to be able to survive as long. They're going to leave the industry. As they leave the industry, the price will go up and we'll arrive at zero profit. So in the long run, zero economic profit. If we go back and think about our diagram 
Where does that mean? So if we were to imagine this long run profit condition in a short run period, right? And keep in mind when we introduced our long run, we kind of said, just think about the long run is a whole bunch of short run periods all linked together. So if we were at this long run profit situation in a short run period, where are we at? Well, let's take a look, right? We're at zero profits. So you're like, oh, hey, Keith, we just looked at that just a little while ago. Yeah, 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 exactly. We're just going to draw that again. We're just going to draw that again. A little bit of extra practice um, or on the other side, just to let us see this again, if you were a little bit. But our cost again, What's where, where are we? It's just going to be a bit of a... Average variable cost, average total cost, both of them U-shaped. Average variable cost first, the average total cost starting off with the bigger gap and then getting closer together as quantity increases. Keep in mind again, this vertical distance, that is our average fixed cost. Marginal cost has its initial dip, comes up through the minimum average variable, our minimum average total, and then carries on upwards. There's our marginal cost. And if we want to draw this such that profit equals zero, well, okay, let's write our profit condition again. Profit was price minus average total cost times Q star. So profit will be zero when price equals average total cost. What about Q star? Where does that come from? Well, Q star is the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Keep in mind what do we have here? Marginal revenue, the same thing as price. It's also the same thing as average revenue. So what we're really saying is that we need all of these to be equal at the same point. Where does that occur? Marginal cost equals average total cost right there. So if marginal cost equals average total cost right there, and we need marginal cost to equal marginal revenue equals price, we need a horizontal price line that passes through. So let's see if I can do that. Oh, that's a little bit high. That's a little bit high. Let's just move that. There we go. Right there. There's my price. Price equals average revenue equals marginal revenue. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost right at our point there. And so what does that give us? That gives us our value of Q star, our profit maximizing level of output, such that as we carry Q star back up, we get our average variable cost, and we get our bit too high I want just so I can see the line but it's technically the same point right there I have my average total cost equal to the price so zero profit here what does this mean this means that earning zero profit I am operating at capacity if I'm operating at capacity in this long run profit situation I have shown, okay, here's my long run profit condition of zero in a short run period. How do I know this is a short run cost diagram? Well, because I have this distinction, right, between average total and average variable cost, such that this distinction here, this vertical distance, this is my average fixed cost. Fixed costs imply capital is fixed, which means it's a short run diagram. All that to be said, okay, if I'm in my long run profit scenario, at capacity, earning zero profit, where would I find myself on the corresponding long run average cost curve? Let's take a look at that. So dollars per unit, again, that's price. Quantity, we have our long run average cost curve. Long run average cost curve looking something like that, right? If our short run cost curves are U shaped, our long run cost curves are saucer shaped. And keep in mind 
that our short run average total cost curves just sat inside of these being tangent at one point and one point only, such that we had, it's not supposed to have this little dip up here, that doesn't exist. Right when we hit this flat stretch, when we have our increasing returns to our constant returns, we have at this point here our minimum efficient scale. MES, minimum efficient scale. Keep in mind, we took a look at this when we took a look at our relationships between the short run and the long run. At this point, we have our short run, short run average total cost being tangent right at capacity. So, okay, hey, 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 hey. If I'm right at capacity, and this is my long run profit condition, well, okay, I'm at capacity in the short run. I'm in my long run profit condition. Where am I on this curve? Hey, well, there's my capacity on my short run curve. I'm in a long run profit condition, so I must have this optimal ratio of labor and capital for Q star. It must be then that I'm also right there at Q star at my minimum efficient scale. So we can carry that bit on, showing that, hey, in the long run, a perfectly competitive firm is going to be earning zero profit, would be at capacity in the short run. And because that's the case, they will also be at their minimum efficient scale in the long run. So we have that relationship showing up there. That's about all we're going to get into with this relationship between the short run and the long run and the whole idea of how we enter exit. Next idea that we want to take a look at is how we bring all of these different firms together to get our idea of a market supply or how much is going to be provided to the market altogether. Let's take a look at that next. Okay, in order to figure out our supply or how much is being offered to the market, what we need to realize is that as we deal with our short run cost curves, is that we've always taken some price over to our marginal cost curve and brought it down to find our Q star, right? This was the optimal quantity that this representative firm was supplying or producing, right? We can take a look at that at a different point. I'm going to jump and use white for this one. And we could say, okay, what if we had a price up like this? Well, hey, if this was my price, average revenue, marginal revenue price, marginal revenue to marginal cost, right? Price to marginal cost. As soon as we hit that, that's going to be my profit maximizing level. So at that higher price, I would have this higher quantity. So right as price went up, quantity produced or quantity supplied, this optimal quantity produced, this profit maximizing quantity produced, increased as well. So we have this relationship between prices and quantities. What we can do then is we can say, okay, sure, this is a representative firm. This is just one firm out of thousands of firms in this perfectly competitive market. What if we were to take all of these firms and we were to add them all up together? So let's take a look at what happens if we do that. So let's say that we have, I'm just going to draw, I'm going to cheat, but I'm just going to be a little bit lazy. And I'm just going to presume we have two firms. And what I'm going to take a look at in these two firms is my average variable cost curves, and I'm going to attempt, big attempt here, to make our cost curves identical. And the rationale behind that, if you keep in mind, what we had said for our determinants of market structure, we had perfect information. That is, we all had access to the same technology, we all had access to all the same everything, meaning that we all had identical cost curves. So ideally, that's what I'm trying to do here. Um, did I do it very well? 
Ah, uh, that's up for debate. Labeling our axes. Okay, we have our axes there. And then throwing in our final one, our marginal cost. Marginal cost, minimum average variable, minimum average total, carrying up. And then same thing over there. Keep in mind, this would be representative firm one. Representative firm one. Representative firm two. And we have the cost curves of each one. And you would imagine that in reality, we'd be taking a look at representative firm one all the way through to representative firm one million, right? We'd be taking a look at all of them. And then what we'd want to do is we'd want to bring this across to work out what is happening in our market on whole. So we would have our Q, our dollars per unit, and this would be our market. And what we'd want to do is we would want to kind of get starting right here at wrong tool. Starting right here at our minimum average variable cost. That's actually not bad. It is about that minimum average variable cost on both sides. Okay, so at this minimum average variable cost, and the reason why we're starting here, we remember this was our price minimum. Any price below that point, and we were just shutting down, right? We went and we said, shade this in, we will not operate in this area. And then we went and we figured out, okay, we're able to produce much, we're able to produce so much. Let's give it a number. Let's say that this firm would be producing two units and two units. What does that mean? Well, if this firm is producing two units and this firm is producing two units, well, then all together in the market, we have, we can kind of put our first point, maybe something like this. All together, we have a market supply of four. Right, that's what is being produced all together. Two from this firm, two from that firm, giving us two being supplied to the market. If we carry this price line up, right, so maybe we have a little bit of a higher price now, just jumping it up as such. So here, we'll just call this generically P1. Price, average revenue, marginal revenue, to marginal cost. We're going to get our new quantity produce our new Q star we're going to get our new Q star and we can say that this is now I don't know four so four and four that's going to give us what maybe this guy here we now have eight and we could keep doing this process right we could go one more go one more up we're going to have here e2 at P2, again from each firm, we're going to have boom and boom. This is our Q star where price, average revenue, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And if we carry on, maybe this is six. All right, I'm just kind of assuming this linear two, four, six, just for simplicity, meaning that what do I have over here? Somewhere about Six and six, what does that give me? Six from this firm, six from that firm gives me 12 altogether. If I take all this and I say, okay, I have that point, I have that point, I have that point, these are our combinations of P min, P1, and P2, so price minimum, price one, and price two. If I aim to connect these dots, I get a upward sloping line that would continue in this fashion here. And we would call this upward um, sloping line our supply curve. And this is our market supply curve. Keeping in mind that all this market supply curve really is, is our horizontal aggregation of each individual firm's marginal cost curve. And we've just said, okay, firm one can produce two at price min. Firm two can produce two at price min. So altogether, we're producing four at price min. 
on and on and on and on. That is, we can also think about this. Hey, if this is the marginal cost of firm one, if this is the marginal cost of firm two, and this is, you know, both explicit and implicit costs included in this, then okay, this is our market supply. This is also the market or society's marginal cost of production. All of our explicit and implicit trade-offs that are recorded in this supply curve. So we can think about it two ways. We can think about it as price to quantity, being okay, quantity supplied. There we go, four, that's a quantity supplied, quantity supplied, quantity supplied. The curve itself is the supply. Number is the quantity supplied, curve is the market supply. Or we can go the other way, we can start at a quantity supplied, and we can say, okay, at a quantity supplied of four, we have a marginal cost of PM, price minimum, right? That was the extra cost to produce this last unit. So we could read it both ways, get two interpretations of this supply curve. Final interpretation, and this is gonna wrap us right back to trade. The final way we could view this supply curve is we could view this as our minimum willingness to accept. That is, if we take a look at any quantity, we can say that the firm, when the firm is producing eight units, let's make that a bit bigger. When the firm is producing eight units, the lowest price that they would accept for these eight units is P1. If you were to offer them a price higher than P1, they'd be more than happy to sell these eight units to you. But given that this was their optimal price in order to produce eight units or four and four, we would not be willing to accept anything less than P1 in order to produce eight units. Carrying on, if I were to produce more, if you were to try to get me to produce 12 units, well, if I made 12 units, I would not accept a price less than P2. So quantity to price, I have either minimum willingness to accept or marginal cost as an interpretation, price to quantity supplied, and I have market supply as an interpretation. So a few different ways to think about this curve. What we're gonna be doing now, we're gonna be walking away from producer theory. This wraps us up for producer theory for the time being. We're gonna be jumping over to the consumer next week. We're gonna be taking a look at the consumer, we're gonna be taking a look at their consumption decisions, and then from their consumption decisions, we're gonna work out what their demand is for our goods, and then from that demand for the goods, we're also gonna work out, don't set a minimum willingness to accept, we'll work out the maximum willingness to pay. We'll then ultimately bring that supply curve, we'll bring that demand curve that we'll put together together, and we'll use this supply and demand model to analyze, hey, what's our equilibrium price? What is our market clearing price? We'll actually de determine how prices are determined, that is to say, and how much stuff is bought and sold together. So that's our plan over the next, say, two weeks, next into consumer theory.